Welcome to the very first wedding Q&A of a brand new year. Today we're covering invitation etiquette, late night music, tips on wedding insurance, stationery, and so much more. That's all coming up next on the Wedding Planning Podcast. Hey there, it's Kara, and I believe that every engaged couple deserves the expertise of a down-to-earth, honest, and professional wedding planner. Join me each week on the Wedding Planning Podcast for straightforward advice designed to streamline and simplify your wedding plans. Are you ready to ditch the crushing wedding overwhelm and expense felt by so many engaged couples? To sign up for a free three-day trial of my revolutionary digital wedding planning package, visit weddingplanningpodcast.co slash vault. That's V-A-U-L-T. There's no promo code required for the free trial, and I can't wait to see you there. Enjoy the show. Why, hello there, and welcome to today's brand new show. I am so excited to be sharing the first wedding Q&A show of the brand new year. I have been such a busy bee over here getting brand new shows put together and ready to share with you, and I have a ton of your wonderful questions to share today. So without further ado, let me mention quickly that if you would like to submit your wedding questions for our next show, which we do these every couple weeks or so, you simply need to follow me on Instagram, look for Wedding Planning Podcast, and shoot me a DM with your questions. I can't wait to hear from you. I can't wait to learn more about you and your wedding. And with that, let's dive right in. First question for today, what is good etiquette for sending a wedding invitation to someone when you know they're unable to attend your wedding? As a side note, their coworkers who I'm not very close with or fond of, but I felt pressured to invite them because I work closely with them. If you're sure that they cannot make it to your wedding either way, I would maybe just have a conversation about that part instead of sending them an actual invitation. If you really do want to officially invite them and you are 100% sure that they will not be attending, then I don't think there's much more to it than that. I would be careful though, because if you send a wedding invitation to someone and they can attend, it sounds to me like you don't really want to have them there. So take a one more pass through your options, but in terms of good etiquette, there isn't a precedent here, and I would encourage you to do whatever it is you need to do to keep things smooth and sound with those coworkers. Next question, what do you think about having music playing late for a backyard wedding? Is 10 o'clock a strict courtesy or does it depend on the specific neighborhood and day? This is a wonderful question and for the precise answer, you will need to consult with your own local authorities. The last thing on earth you want is to have your wedding getting shut down for a noise violation at 10.05 p.m. on a Saturday night. Every area, every community, every HOA is going to have very specific and likely very different rules on what the actual quiet hours are. When we hosted our wedding at a private residence, we went so far as to visit the local police station and ask them what the regulations were. It sounds like maybe overkill, but again, the worst case scenario would be to have an angry, disgruntled neighbor making a phone call to the police and having police show up at your wedding to shut things down. And next question for today, do you have any tips on getting wedding insurance, maybe good companies to work with, etc.? I sure do. We have an entire episode dedicated to wedding insurance permits and licensing. That show has been expired, but it is available inside my digital wedding planning package. The even better news is that there's a free three-day trial so that you can go in, take a look around, listen to that wedding insurance show. If you love it, then I hope you'll stick around and remain a member. If it's not for you, that's no problem whatsoever. There's no obligation, there's no contract, and you're free to cancel your membership anytime. 
So to take advantage of that wedding insurance episode with so much more information in it and dozens and dozens of other shows and bonus materials, all you need to do is visit wedpodcast.com slash vault. That's V-A-U-L-T. And next up is a question about stationery. We've decided to have a micro ceremony now in mid-March to be exact, so just a couple months from this recording. And then we're going to have a big reception on our one-year anniversary, and we will be live streaming to everyone on the invite list who's not in attendance for the micro ceremony. My thought is to send out Save the Dates now, saying something about join us now online and join us later in person. So the question is, is it too soon to send Save the Dates over a year away? And then question number two, should I just send the live stream invitations now and in a few months send the real Save the Dates? Okay, stick with me because there's more here. Also, we have several friends and family members we're not inviting that we know would love an announcement card. So for example, overseas friends or family who we've never even met. Uh, I know you've said that if they get a save the date, then they should get an invitation. So what would be a good way to word an announcement that we're getting married that doesn't sound like an invitation? Okay, I'm going to pause there and answer the questions we have so far. So first off, I would send an announcement of your marriage after your micro ceremony in March that doesn't mention anything about your follow-up reception or the live stream. So to clarify, if you're sending announcements to these people who you do not know, you've never met them, they're overseas, distant family, distant friends, I would send an announcement that you are married with, again, no mention anything about a reception or a live stream or a micro ceremony. This is just an announcement card. That's it. Backing up to the questions before that, is it too soon to send save the dates over a year away? I would wait until maybe the nine to six month mark before the actual reception celebration before you drop those save the dates in the mail. And then in terms of the live stream invitations for your micro ceremony that's happening in March for a digital streaming situation, I would recommend making your life really, really easy and sending those invitations digitally. I know that digital invites aren't for everyone, but when we're talking specifically about a live stream, it's going to make everyone's life so easy just to have all that information within one email. There are tons of providers who have really, really nice email templates for this. So do a Google search and explore your options there. If you are really having your heart set on sending some kind of physical paper invitation for that live stream, then it might you might want to think about sending the save the dates with that combo invite to the live stream. Just go ahead and send them now. Ideally, we wouldn't send save the dates quite this early. But again, if your heart is set on a physical invitation versus digital, then go ahead and go that route. Woo, lots to unpack in this question. So just one more bit. Also for the micro ceremony, we want to go all out for the invitation since we only need 12 of them and the only people coming are family who we know will actually keep them. Where do you suggest we go online to get really fancy invitations? We even want to seal the envelopes with a custom wax seal. We're feeling very bougie. Okay, so for this, I would recommend searching on Etsy.com for handmade invitations, maybe even specialty calligraphy invitations, and also wax seals are something that wedding calligraphers can often handle for you. I have a very, very good friend who I have worked with for years and years who's a wedding calligrapher, and I will link to her information in today's show notes if you'd like to send her a message. Otherwise, just go to Etsy.com and search handmade wedding invitation, calligraphy wedding invitation, and you will come back with thousands of options to choose from. 
Okay, next question. We're sticking with the theme of save the dates for just one second. Hi, Cara. Love the podcast. I'm recently engaged and we just booked our venue for June of 2022. Any recommendations for when we should send our save the dates and invitations? Also, would this summer be too early for us to do a Jack and Jill party, depending on COVID guidelines? All right. So again, with save the dates, I would recommend holding on to those and dropping them in the mail roughly nine to six months before your wedding celebration. Now, if you are planning a destination wedding or a wedding that's going to entail a ton of travel and a ton of effort for people to make it to, you could back that out to even a year before the wedding. So this is flexible. These dates are not like hard and fast and in any wedding planning law book. Do what you think fits your situation the best, but for a very general guideline, I would shoot for about the nine month mark before the wedding to drop those save the dates in the mail. And then in terms of when to send the actual invitations, there has been so much turmoil in the wedding world over this past year with just so many special situations and micro ceremonies and bigger ceremonies and receptions and follow-up receptions. I feel like the rules have just gotten so muddled with everything and all the special situations and events that are going on. General rule of thumb for me personally with invitations is anywhere around the three month mark before the actual wedding day. So you're getting married in June of 2022. You can hold on to those actual invitations until much later, spring of 2022. And then last part of this question is about hosting a Jack and Jill shower. Just to recap for anyone who's not familiar with the term, this is a co-ed wedding shower. So traditionally, a bridal shower is just women. A Jack and Jill is a co-ed shower. This summer, we're a whole year ahead of your actual wedding. This summer feels a little bit early to host a wedding shower, so a co-ed wedding shower. I would maybe suggest, because... That bridal shower or the wedding shower typically takes place much closer to your actual wedding day. So I'm thinking that would happen later next year, spring of 2022. What if you framed this celebration? You can still have the party. I still want you to have the party. What if you framed it more as an engagement party? So if you take a look back to the episode we just did last week on January 20th, The entire episode is all about unique and creative engagement party ideas. We talk about fun venues, theme ideas, activities, etiquette, all of it. So go back and take a listen to that episode if you missed it. The timing feels a little bit more appropriate for an engagement party versus a shower. And then your Jack and Jill can be saved for closer to the wedding in 2022. And next question, uh, the listener writes, this is a little odd, but timely. My wedding is in 2022 and I'm currently interviewing potential vendors. Is it appropriate to ask the vendors who will be present on the wedding day if they are planning on getting the COVID vaccine? For that matter, is it rude to ask guests that they be vaccinated prior to the event? Sorry if it's tactless, but I have a number of older relatives and immune compromised family members that I have to look out for. Thank you so much for sending in this question. It is a really interesting one. And the very short answer is that I'm not sure what the landscape is going to look like in 2022, but I really, really wish I did. This has been such a traumatic and devastating past year I have my entire heart goes out to anyone who's been affected by COVID, you, your friends, your family. I really don't know many people who haven't. And that is absolutely heartbreaking. What the pandemic has done to the wedding industry and the celebration industry and the events industry has just been completely catastrophic. So again, I just want to take this moment to, number one, tell you that my heart is with you if you have been personally deeply affected by this horrible pandemic. And number two, I also want to say thank you. 
thank you, thank you to any essential workers, nurses, teachers, firefighters, law enforcement, anyone who's been working and keeping things afloat for the rest of us. Thank you from the bottom of my heart and from everyone else's heart. I know they feel it as well. Now, there has been a lot of posturing in the event space about what our post-COVID vaccine world is going to look like and whether vaccines will be mandatory for private group events like concerts, festivals, weddings. Um, It's really challenging because we have civil liberties at odds with public health. We have a very acrimonious environment right now in terms of people being on the same page and having differing viewpoints and having a really hard time meeting in the middle on science and facts. So with everything going on, it's just really difficult to predict what this is all going to look like in a year or even 18 months from now. I will say that I think it's fair to ask vendors if they'll be vaccinated or not just as part of your interview process. And along with that question, be prepared for folks to say that they will not be getting the vaccine. Given this full transparency and you collect all the information and then you can proceed with a decision based on those facts. In terms of requiring or mandating that your guests be vaccinated, I mean, this seems like a reasonable thing to ask, but once again, be prepared for people to express their views and also their refusal that they will not be getting vaccinated. Given that your wedding is still 18 months away and we're learning more and more about vaccines and COVID immunity literally by the day, sometimes by the hour, This isn't something that I would rush out tomorrow and start issuing ultimatums over. You definitely, 100%, you have a legitimate concern, but I would advise that you sit tight and wait to have the vaccine discussion with people you're inviting closer to when you're sending out those invitations in the next year. We reviewed a question a while back about a maid of honor who literally refused to wear a face mask per the venue guidelines, and she literally did not go to the wedding over it. So again, unfortunately, we live in a very, very divisive world right now, and managing your relationships with your family and your friends, as if that was not hard enough before... Today, it feels like a matter of life and death every time you turn a corner. Coming up after a quick break, I have lots more of your wedding questions to share on negotiating with vendors, calculating how much food you'll need, creative reception entertainment ideas, and lots more. I'll be back in just a minute. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at MyWeddingSongs.com. With the millions of songs to sample on streaming services like Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube, Pandora, and plenty of others, finding your wedding day music can be a daunting task. However, it doesn't have to be. Our friends at MyWeddingSongs.com created playlists of the most requested wedding songs so that you can take the guesswork and the stress out of choosing music for your special day. Not sure exactly when to play what songs throughout the ceremony and reception? MyWeddingSongs.com features a wedding day playlist with common events including walking down the aisle all the way until the last dance. There's even a list of the 101 greatest wedding songs of all time. Want to know the newly released wedding songs that haven't been played at every single wedding your guests have been to? Check out their Hot 50 Picks and Best New Songs playlists. With more than 600 playlists, there is something for everyone, including love songs, song lists by eras, genres, and dance styles. And don't forget to sign up for their monthly newsletter to get exclusive song ideas sent right to your inbox. Visit MyWeddingSongs.com today to prepare your wedding music for free. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at BetterHelp. Planning an entire wedding in the midst of everything else going on in your life can be a really stressful time. And if you find your happiness is suffering, BetterHelp is here for you. BetterHelp will assess your individual needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. 
you can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. BetterHelp is committed to partnering you with your perfect therapeutic match, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com wedding. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash wedding. Hey, right now is the perfect time to start planning your destination wedding or your honeymoon. My name is Susan Green and I'm at Susan's Travel Services and I'm available to you with my team for free to help you with all the planning and details of your dream honeymoon or destination wedding. A lot of couples come to us and say they're worried about working with a travel agent is going to be one more expense to pay and that's simply not true. In fact, working with us should save you time, money, and we want to make sure that that trip is the best trip yet. We have over 25 years in the industry and we specialize specialize in travel around the world. Let us help you find the best deals, all-inclusive resorts, Mexico, Caribbean, exotic cruises, or how about those overwater bungalows in the Maldives and Bora Bora. Don't get overwhelmed with the millions of places and opinions online. Get some free help and rely on professional experience to make sure you get exactly what you're looking for with your dream vacation or destination wedding. And hey, have I mentioned again that we're free? Email us at susan at Susan's Travel Services and tell us that you heard us on this awesome podcast. And we're going to give you $50 off your final payment. What's even better, you tell a friend to contact us and they give us your referral, we'll give you another $50 off your trip. Guess what? If you're doing a destination wedding and you tell someone else, we'll give you $250 off your destination wedding. See, we want to make it easy for you and we want to work with you. We've been in the business a long time. We're really excited about your destination wedding, honeymoon, and getting to know you as a client. Have an awesome day. Okay, we're back and a humongous thank you again for being here with me and hanging out with me for a few minutes of your day. Next question for today. You mentioned in one episode that the best way to save on money is to negotiate the big ticket items. Can you do an episode on negotiating the best prices and exactly how to do that? I just got a quote from a rental company for a little over $7,000 and I was really hoping everything would be $5,000 max. I may have to cut some things out to make it work. Thank you. This is a wonderful question, negotiating the big ticket items like your venue, photography, catering, and rentals, just to name a few, is indeed the best way to make a big impact on your bottom line. We went over all of this in a budget conversation that published earlier this uh, month in January of 2021. So go back and have a listen to that if you missed it. I do have a series on hiring your main wedding vendors that's in the works for the coming months. So you can look forward to much more to come on specifics for negotiating with potential venues, photographers, caterers, and lots more. So you can see that given I have dedicated an entire series to this topic, there is a ton to talk about in terms of negotiating the best prices. And the nuance is a little bit different depending on which vendor you're working with. For this one, for a rental company, if you're getting a quote that's $2,000 over your target budget, the best way to negotiate is to flip the tables around and tell the rental company, okay, $7,000 is $2,000 above our budget. What can we take away? What can we substitute? What can we scale back on that gets us down to $5,000? This puts the ball in their court and it allows them to show you exactly how you can make it all work with what you have. $7,000 to $5,000 is a big gap, but it's not like outside the realm of possibility. So if you were to say that the quote was for $7,000, but your total budget was $1,000, then my advice would be very, very different. But because we're in the ballpark and we're within a reasonable sum between your target and the actual quoted price, I think you can go to them and say, okay, fine, then show us how we can get down to this $5,000 number. 
So in a nutshell, that's what I would recommend doing in this situation. Again, I have an entire series dedicated to negotiating with all of your different vendors. And I'll mention quickly, if you'd like to skip ahead and just get to all of that valuable content now, you can do so with a membership to my digital wedding planning package that I mentioned earlier in today's show. The Vault has a treasure trove of all of my best wedding planning advice, and it's available to you for just $9.99 per month. Yes, less than $10 per month, and you can access everything. You can even take advantage of a free three-day trial. There's no obligation. Learn more, sign up, get all set up at wedpodcast.com slash vault. All right, next question. Wondering if you have any resources on simple yet elegant centerpieces that are not flower-based. I'm struggling hard. My mother-in-law is a florist and I don't want her to spend a ton of money on flowers, so I'd love to stay away from using too many. I do have a fantastic episode that explores both flower centerpieces that are really, really affordable and some alternatives to using flowers. That episode is titled Affordable Centerpieces, and you can find it if you scroll back in your feed to May 13th of 2020. Next question. I've been an avid listener for the past year or so. I love the program. Thank you so much for all that you do. You're so welcome. (laughs) My question is any advice for how to handle an eyesore in the middle of a venue space? Okay, so I'm going to describe the venue space here. We're in a hotel banquet room. Our dance floor has a big square column in the middle of the room. I don't want to highlight it, but I also don't want anyone running into it. That would be terrible. Um, I've looked on Pinterest, but have not found much help. Is there an episode I might have missed? The column is wallpapered, beige colors with wood. We've thought about lights wrapped around the top half, but I'm afraid this is going to draw the eye like right to the eyesore. So another decor option that they're considering is green ivy garland wrapped around the top with some fairy lights and flowers. Any direction would be helpful. Again, appreciate all that you do. You're so welcome, and this is a great question and a very common dilemma of how to deal with an eyesore. Now, traditionally, if there's a big, huge, awkward piece in the middle of something, a room, a wall, and you don't want to highlight attention to it, we don't want to decorate it. We want to do everything we can do to keep people from looking at it. However, the irony in this situation is that the eyesore is literally in the middle of the dance floor. So like you mentioned, we don't want people running into it either. So we're kind of stuck. We're going to have to draw some attention to this column in the middle of the space so that people don't just smack right into it, which sadly and kind of funnily enough, I could see happening after a few cocktails. In any case, I think you have answered your own question. I absolutely love the idea of putting some kind of garland around the top with some fairy lights and some flowers. This is going to call attention to the presence of it, but it's going to dress it up a little bit. You said it's wallpapered with beige and a wood piece. That doesn't sound too attractive to me. Uh, So by decorating that column a little bit, we're just going to have to deal with it. It is what it is. And making it look a little prettier sounds like the best option to me. Okay, and next question for today. I told you this was a jam-packed episode. So many good questions. I've been listening for months and you've helped me a lot in planning. I have one question for you. My fiance and I met at church and our families are very religious. We're not allowed to have alcohol or dancing at our wedding because of our religion and our families are expecting us to abide by that rule. However, we also have a lot of guests who are not from our church and we're wondering how to make our wedding fun without alcohol and dancing. It's the one thing that's been stressing me out about our wedding. I can't think of any fun activities that won't make it feel like a children's party instead of a wedding. Another great question, and we could do an entire episode on creative and fun reception entertainment ideas. Alcohol and dancing are two big ones. So when we take those away, we need to get a little bit more creative. 
uh, look forward to a longer show on this topic because it's a very popular question. But quickly for today, I'll give you just a couple ideas off the top of my head. One that's always really fun for everyone is to leave blank cards on the tables for your guests to fill out with their top wedding advice. So maybe it's an idea for a date night. Maybe it's a fun recipe to cook together. Maybe it's just some words of wisdom on how to make your make the most out of your marriage. Whatever it is, it's a fun way to get guests thinking about advice that they want to share with you. And then bonus, all those cards make a really, really nice keepsake for you and your new husband as well. Next idea, this sounds a little childish, child birthday party like you mentioned in your note, but bear with me. Uh, hiring a magician can be a really unexpected and fun way to keep your guests entertained at a reception. Uh, also a caricature artist to draw portraits of all of your guests. This is, again, a really fun activity and it doubles as a take-home wedding favor that your guests can take home with them to remember your wedding day. So that's kind of a double duty, really special little gesture to your guests. Next quick idea, a fun photo booth setup is always fun. Everyone loves to snap selfies of themselves and share them. So you can set up a photo booth on your own. You can check out our friends at boothbymail.com. They have some really fun props and a really easy package that's just, they simply send you everything, you use it and have fun with it, and then you send it back. So check out boothbymail.com for much more info on setting up a DIY photo booth. And then, of course, there's always good old lawn games, uh, cornhole, the game where you throw the golf balls on the string around the, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's escaping me right now. Um, Bottle Bash is a really fun lawn game that we have recently discovered in my circle, and we're pretty obsessed with it. Uh, giant Jenga, anything like that. It's just fun. It's lighthearted. Your guests will have a good time with it. And then last idea really quickly would be some kind of like a chocolate fountain or a fondue fountain for the dessert setup so that guests can kind of interact and have a hands-on experience making their dessert. I hope these were helpful. Again, I will do a full-length episode on creative entertainment ideas because it's a hot topic, a very popular question, and I could talk about it for half an hour easily. <laughs> so much more to come on that. All right. And final question for today. We're thinking of offering different food stations at our wedding, kind of like a buffet, but picking foods that really speak to us as a couple. So for instance, a biscuits and gravy bar, fried chicken and a southern side, orange chicken and egg rolls, etc. Wondering if you have a good way to figure out how many servings of each we should be planning for. So for example, my mom will not eat fried chicken, but she would eat biscuits and gravy. Some people will eat a little bit of everything. Some people will eat nothing. Hope that makes sense. Oh, my friend, it makes perfect sense. And this is the central dilemma to planning a really creative and unique catering spread. Now, you didn't mention if you're actually using professional, a professional caterer or caterers to help you pull this off. So I'm going to give you kind of both sides of it. I know... You know those amazing drink calculator tools that can tell you how much beer, wine, and cocktails you need based on the number of guests? We need one of those just for food. <laughs> so my husband, John, and I, I've told this story many times on the podcast, we prepared all of our food for our wedding reception with heavy help from our friends and our family, of course. And before we did this, we ran a live experiment a side note here, you may have heard me do the exact same experiment with John for our DIY appetizer episode that ran last year. This is just a really useful way for determining exactly how much food you need. And it's really simple. So you are going to order servings of all your favorite foods, the things you're considering serving. And then make a plate of what you would eat and have your partner make a plate of what they would eat. And then if you want to gather a larger sample size, so to speak, you can invite over your parents or a couple friends and have everyone make a plate of what they would eat. And then I know it sounds kind of silly, 
but very deliberately take pictures of each plate or measure out each plate. Take notes. How many pieces of chicken did people take? How many biscuits did people take? You might be surprised when I did this experiment with John when I was prepping that DIY appetizer episode that I mentioned, I was really hung up on thinking about how many vegetables should be there. And then when I put everything in front of him, he literally said, I would not eat any vegetables. So you can count those out. And he only took meat and cheese and crackers. So all that's to say, you might be surprised by the results. You can calculate it in your head, but when you actually see it live and in action, it's oftentimes really surprising how much or how little people will actually put on their plate. Now, if you are planning on working with a professional caterer to help you set this all up, they're going to be able to offer much more precise guidance for you, but that comes at a cost. So if you're trying to kind of keep it really affordable, and you want to manage this yourselves, I will say that running out of one thing and having too much of another thing is likely going to be inevitable. And in the grand scheme of things, it's really not that big of a deal. It is really important with any type of DIY, any type of DIY, anything, but specifically catering, really important to do your best to keep it simple. Really nailing those portions without ending up with a ton of food waste is going to be more and more difficult with every menu item you add. So I would really recommend sticking to three, maybe four, maybe five menu items max just to keep things simple. Okay, my friend, I hope you found a few nuggets that were really helpful to you in today's show. Thank you so much for your support of the show. Thank you for being here with me today. And I can't wait to chat again next week, same time, same place, and get excited because I have a very, very special new series to share with you. We'll talk again next week. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Wedding Planning Podcast. For a list of any links and resources called out in today's show, take a peek at the show notes in your podcast player whenever you have a hands-free moment. You can also subscribe to receive convenient show recaps via email by visiting weddingplanningpodcast.co. While you're there, you can browse a library of all past episodes and view special offers from our sponsors. That website again is weddingplanningpodcast.co. Thank you so much for including me and the Wedding Planning Podcast in your wedding plans. And I'll talk to you again next week, same time, same place.